phone in the bin. So as we kind of looked at that poll, you can see that um, the majority of reasons why people throw food away, through, throw food away from the home that could have been eaten is it wasn't used in time. So you can see from the mouldy bread, I bought it, I, I ate half the loaf, but it just went mouldy before I had a chance to eat it all. Um, didn't fancy it, so just personal preference. It looked really good in the supermarket. I fancied those, those um, purple sprout and broccoli, but it's a Tuesday night. I fancy something different um, and cook too much. So again, plate scraping. So just cooking too much food to begin with and just having it left over. Um, so again, whilst there is an element of food waste that we can't ever get rid of, there is a, the vast majority is food waste that we can buy through better choices and better actions reduce. So if we look at a Buckinghamshire picture, so we don't have kind of core information for Buckinghamshire, we just don't collect the detailed information as to what happens in everyone's home. So if we look at the national data and distill it into Buckinghamshire, and Buckinghamshire is about average for, for the nation, so it kind of works well. So you can see that's 240 kilos of food is wasted in every home every year. Um, so just via weight, that's a lot. But if you break that down to kind of what you could have used, it's about 400 meals in every average home, which is just kind of boggles the mind really when you think about it. I and mean, we're all guilty of it. Sometimes it's easy to kind of say, everyone's doing this wrong. We all do it, everyone wastes food. There's no kind of um, innocent party. So as a council, it's our duty to pick up all waste from householders. Now we collect it in lots of different ways um, and food waste is a big proportion of that. So if we look at what's created in Buckinghamshire, about 50,000 tonnes of food waste is created in Buckinghamshire homes every year. Um, and that equates to about a quarter maybe of all the waste that we produce. So it's a big chunk for us to deal with. Um, and at the moment, depending on what residents do with it in the home, depends on where it goes. So the waste, the food that they've actually wasted, the 50,000 tonnes, if they use the separate weekly collection, which almost all homes in Buckinghamshire have now, then if they do that, which would be fantastic if everyone did, then that food waste would go to a thing called anaerobic digestion which is essentially like a huge industrial human stomach. It, you chuck it in the tank, you pasteurize it and clean it, make sure there's no bits of plastic and, and um, other things in there. You throw it in the tank with some bacteria and you churn it around. And as a human stomach does, that bacteria produces biogas and you take that off and you produce electricity from it. And at the end, you're left with a high quality fertilizer, digestate, and that can go onto farmers' fields. So by keeping the food separate, we can treat it separately and get more energy from it and make it into a more useful resource. Um, unfortunately, for lots of different reasons, only about 30% of the food that's wasted in Buckinghamshire homes ends up in the separate food recycling collection. So as a council, we can't go into your home and sort your bins for you. It relies on residents bringing the food to the separate collection. So only about 30% of food is actually collected separately. Now, over 50% of people actually recycle food at home, as it were, they have the caddy, they put the caddy out regularly. So there's a mixture of not enough people recycling the food, only about 50% do. And of those that do, they don't always recycle everything that they could, either through lack of awareness or just uh, motivation. So what do we do about that? So, it's, so like I said, as a council, we can provide a service, but we need residents to use it. So we have to work hard to encourage residents to use the food recycling service, explaining the benefits. So it does go to a separate recycling facility that's, that's custom made for food waste make it easy to do. So again, the weekly service, um, showing people what they can and can't do with it. Um, and delivering a good quality service is really important as well. So that one really is down to us. We need to make sure we put those bins back properly. We, we treat the caddies nicely. We don't throw them around, which doesn't always, um, isn't, isn't always the case. So by getting people to use the scheme that's there, we can definitely, in theory, collect all that unavoidable food waste, all the tea bags and coffee grounds and chicken bones and fish skin, we could collect all of that and that'd be fantastic. But what we also have to do is try and divert food waste from any kind of waste stream and stop producing it in the first place. So although you've kind of produced your tea bags and coffee grounds and, and vegetable peelings, you could home compost them. So you could recycle them in, in the caddy, that'd be great. Or you could compost them at home, which would mean it doesn't become a waste stream as it were, it doesn't enter the council's uh, management, it doesn't have to manage that and spend the money to do that. It would just stay at your home you get a compost at the end as well. So it's a really good alternative for residents who, can, who want to home compost. Um, and also supporting national and local campaigns. So where you can't avoid 
bones and, and coffee grounds, there is a lot of food waste you can avoid. And again, we can't pop into your home and help you out with that. We need to just show you where you can find the information and encourage people to do that. So lots of national campaigns that do this, it's not just Buckinghamshire. So the government are working to try and reduce food waste across the board. So national campaigns like Love Who Do Waste is one that we probably, you may, may have heard of, which is just trying to tell people and give people the skills and the understanding of how they can reduce their food waste. Um, because food and food habits change so quickly um, and skills get lost. It's really important to try and keep people engaged as what they can and can't do to reduce their food waste. Um, so for example, like I said before, but where, where food is wasted, storage is a key one. Um, so simple things, and, and they do often sound simple until you kind of think, well, actually I could do that a bit better, or I didn't know about that. It's always easy until you know. Um, so trying to encourage people to just do that shopping list before they buy, before they go to the shop. It's amazing the difference it makes. It really reduces how much you buy. Supermarkets are very, very good. And it's their remit, but they're very, very good at convincing you to buy the, that, that one more thing or that thing that looks really good today that's on the end of the aisle. Um, whereas if you go with your list, you're kind of safeguarded from that. You kind of just look at your list. You don't look at everything else. You go get what you need and you come back. And by writing a list, you've also checked your fridge because that's the other thing is you, you kind of think, well, I know what I'm going to have for tea tonight. I'll go and get it. And you come back and you've already got some broccoli or whatever. So you, that ends up getting wasted. So it's kind of buying less um, before you even have to um, waste food storage as well so trying to encourage people to, to store food better so again it's just it's just refreshing what you think you should do with certain items because things change and, and items um, are kept differently in supermarkets for example if they're refrigerated in a supermarket and then you stick them in the cupboard at home they're really going to struggle so it's just trying to keep people um, up to speed with the best ways to store food especially with with uh, different technologies um and other things we do, so that's like the national campaigns and the simple messaging we try to get out there, but we also try to support local actions. So there's a lot of them probably mentioned here today. Um, so the community fridges are, are probably the best example of that. That's, that's a movement that doesn't involve councils doing anything because it's done by fantastic people who want to reduce food waste. And that's their sole focus is to reduce food waste. They collect food and distribute it out to people that can use it. So they're absolutely fantastic. And we as councils try to support them wherever we can because they're doing something that we can't do. We can't have those one-to-one -one conversations with people and really have that in-depth um, uh, communication with residents. But community fridges can do that. They can foster kind of communities around the food, share ideas, share recipes, and fundamentally reduce food and show people what you can and can't do with it. So we try to support any kind of local project like that wherever we can. Um, and the last thing I'll mention is a, is a zero waste map. So on a broader aspect about waste, but the zero waste map does have a lot of food um, options in there is it's an online map that shows you all the places in Buckinghamshire and the surrounding area that you can kind of go and visit and make better options about what, how much you waste so you can go to a refill shop and get your pasta in a jar as opposed to in your plastic um, pre-packed you can go and get fruit veg that's not wrapped and not packaged and possibly hasn't been stored at really cold temperatures which stores so it stores better in your home so we have things like the zero waste map and we're always trying to do new things to try and give people the tools to make the better choices because like I said we can't as a council enforce residents to reduce food waste we can't make them because it's not in our remit but what we can try and do is encourage people to make better choices and show them why because not only does it benefit the environment which in the last three or four years has really been a big factor for, for residents but prior to that it was cost you know if you're buying food and then it's going in the bin you've literally just moved money from the from one pocket to your bin so trying to educate residents as to with the benefits depending on their individual focus um, of reducing their food waste. So we do lots of different stuff um, and fundamentally trying to push that food waste down across the board and nationally it is moving down and hopefully we can continue to do that just by sharing more information and things like the Box Food Revolution will definitely, definitely help us. I think that's me. If I click next, I think I'm done. Yeah, there you go. So I'll stop sharing my screen now. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much for that. That's really interesting. And it's good to see from a Bucks perspective as well, sort of uh, what systems and schemes are in place. So thank you very much for that. Um, next up, we have something uh, a little bit special and it's going to be transporting us um, outside as we actually listen to uh, Sheila, who's on the call today um, and one of the uh, volunteers that help with the allotment. Um, and I think this sort of came as a bit of a, a natural progression, actually, but Sheila's going to explain that in the video 
that you Hello. should. Uh, Welcome to the allotment. This is Mary and Sheila on our allotment, and we've worked here together for over 10 years. And in this journey, Mary's been teaching me about how to cook and how to reduce and save waste. So I thought this was an ideal opportunity to share the skills that Mary has at this conference. So thank you, Mary. If you'd like to start us off with some simple tips on how to reduce food waste that you've learned over the years. Well, I have just a few mantras which uh, keeps me on the straight and narrow. Um, my main one is what needs heating up in the fridge and that will dictate to me what's going to get cooked for supper that night. The other thing that's completely saved my life is a freezer. I couldn't do any of this without a freezer because if you cook once then hopefully you can eat three times and that goes into the freezer and comes out at any time that you fancy something that's absolutely delicious that you just didn't have to think about. It's like a gift. That also but leads so on to portion control because if I'm putting things into the freezer I divide it into something smaller than I fancy because I'm quite greedy. <laughs> <laughs> so if I've only put it in a small portion in the freezer it comes out that way and I'm only allowed to eat that much. Yes. So that's another very important aspect to freezing things. It stops me being greedy. Okay. So do you want another example? Yes, of something if you keep going inspires? with your lovely examples, because we had loads of them before. You mentioned something about so you'd find an item at the supermarket and one was bacon, you were saying. Oh bacon, yes, that's yeah. a good one. That's a good one. I love bacon, but I know it's not terribly good for you. So I will treat myself to bacon and eggs as one thing. And then you think, well, what else can I put bacon in? I think in? what I'd have done was had bacon and eggs for breakfast and then leave the bacon in the fridge till it goes multicoloured and then throw it away. Well, so Mary, go on, what would you do with it? I would put that into a red bean soup, just oh. as a little flavour, but it yeah. goes a long way. Um, I would make a little of it go into carbonara, which is absolutely delicious. So at least three meals mm. out of a small packet of squeaky bacon. And I think you said a quiche? Oh yes, you can well. put it into a quiche yeah. as well. But just be mean, be mean with stuff. Mm. You don't need much. As a flavouring, it works. Mm. So. And which of those would you freeze, for instance? Or would you just use them sequentially? I, I no, I would, I would freeze the soup. That's yeah. absolutely fine. Um, and I would freeze a quiche. So you don't get a soggy bottom? Well, that's arguable. I don't think I've ever made a quiche without a soggy bottom. But that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's choosing your the ones you're going to store and which ones you're yes. going to eat then. Yes, indeed. Later. So yes. carbonara, presumably, you wouldn't Oh, no, fresh, fresh. Fresh, yeah. Mm, that would yeah. have to be fresh. But like a chicken, if you roast a chicken, you have roast chicken the first time then you take it off the bone and it can be all manner of things. It can become a coronation chicken. Um, you can make um, the lovely gravy can be made into a sauce and you can have a chicken pie from that and then you always boil up the chicken carcass and that will create the wonderful basis of a, a soup made from all the sad old vegetables that you found in the bottom of your, your fridge. A bit of celery, the bit of pepper, a bit of everything, a bit of potato, yes. all goes Whatever's in. there, yeah. whatever needs eating up. Yeah. Mantra. Yeah. <laughs> and you also mentioned about preparing three meals at any one time. Yes. Cook, cook once. If you're in the kitchen cooking supper, and you don't want to leave the kitchen because something will boil over or get overcooked, you can't just be sitting there. Um, so make tomorrow's supper at the same time and if you're making tomorrow's supper at the same time make three lots of it so that um, it's efficient use of time if you're stuck in the kitchen for half an hour you might as well do all of those things the only trouble with that is if you're baking a cake at the same time you mustn't use the same utensils which can be easily mm. done mm. I, I can um, 
put an oniony spoon into a cake mixture quite easily. <laughs> you have to separate that. And, and again, if you've got the oven on, mm. you might as well cook two things yeah. rather than one. Yeah. So then that's the cake safely portioned out of your control. Exactly. Exactly. And into the freezer. Cake, yeah. Cut it into eight, keep two and put six slots in the freezer and that'll keep me under control. Yeah, so it's also diet management as well as oh, food totally. management, isn't it? Totally. And we're talking about yeah. fruit because we get gluts of fruit. So what are your thoughts on Ooh. reducing the waste with the fruit that we have? Well, I do, I do bring it home and prepare it. I don't ever um, just freeze fruit chopped up or what have you. I'd like to get the, Not most the apples. No, those are always cooked. Yeah. Uh, some of the apples are cooked for a long time and are almost like a puree. Uh, but other apples, um, I only cook for a little while, and I put it a sign saying lumpy apples. <laughs> so that's Label. good. That's good for a, a crumble. Yeah. What about our soft fruits? Our soft fruits? Raspberry coulis is the food of the gods. Yes, I'll have to with you. Are you putting sugar in? Tiny bit. A bit of sugar. Tiny bit. And I always sieve it because seeds just get stuck. So with the strawberries and the raspberries, they're always sieved. And they, I put them, I freeze them in those little white plastic cups because otherwise um, you don't want too much. And I don't have enough Tupperwares to, but those those do really really well, and mm -hmm. they're just as, enough for two or three days. I put mine into ice cube trays. Oh wow! And then pop them out the ice cube tray, and then put them into a bag, and I can and they'll just they, take out a couple of you can, ice cubes. Don't you? They don't stick together. Oh, well, a quick good. smack on the floor. That'll do it. Thank yeah, you. and they come loose again, so yeah. you can just take out a few. Yeah. So that seems to work for me. No, it's, it's dealing with the the gluts. Mm. If you can put them into a recipe, it's all done for you. So that when you come to the freezer, it's there, ready. Mm. It's like runner beans. Marmalades, jams? I don't make jams. No jams. It's flavoured no sugar. Jam. Yeah. It's flavoured sugar. So I would always use my fruit as a coolie rather than a jam. One, okay. one pot of jam a year is adequate for me. And most people, do you think? I mean, I ask the audience, how many jars of jam do you buy a year? Or do you make them and give them all away? I give them away. Else? I yeah. give them away. They become gifts, yes. really. Yes, they are. They are gifts. That, uh, this year's one was um, Mediterranean relish, which used up our onions, our garlic, our courgettes and tomatoes. I had to buy the peppers, um, but I made a lot of that. And it has a bit of sugar in it, but not like a chutney. So that's gone down quite well. And it goes with everything and it keeps for a year in mm. a jar. So that's perfect. Good and present. You, you talked about doing a base with three ingredients. Onions and... Oh, sofrito. 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 Yes. Well, sofrito. yes, if you have got your onions and your carrots uh, and got a lot of those, the basis of most savoury risottos, bolognese, all sorts, is garlic, onion, celery, garlic, onion, celery and carrot. So you can easily just fry those up. It takes a long time for them to soften properly, I should think an hour. But if you pop those into small containers, it's just a, another easy, easy thing to do. You take it out and it's the basis there of your risotto. Less, to make a risotto using that prepared will take you less than half the time. And it's just so That's convenient. That's another good tip, so that the celery doesn't stay in the fridge. Exactly, the celery will last a long time in the fridge, but not forever. Mm. Mm. And menu planning? Yes, I do tend to know exactly what's going to get consumed in the week. So that things don't linger in the back of the fridge. Yeah, so there's no th get to Thursday and think what you're going to eat. You've already got a There'll be plan options. in your head. There'll yes. be options. Yeah. And shopping? Yes. Once Planning a week. Shopping? Once a week with a long list, which mm. can be added to as you wander around. Mm. But, uh, yeah. 
What about your green leafy vegetables? They tend to come in gluts, the brassicas, the kale, the spinach. Yes, it is spinach a challenge. Spinach tends to keep going. Yeah, it can be a challenge. I mean, the lettuces all come at the same time, don't they? Yeah. The carrots are marvellous because they seem to sit in the earth happily. Um, Freezing spinach? I cook it first because yeah. it takes up such a space. And my, my go-to recipe for spinach is vanicotita, which is absolutely delicious, um, with feta and a few fennel seeds to remind me of ouzo. Yeah. Um, and that freezes perfectly. Mm. So that comes out as a staple. Yeah, so look, spin a up. I, I, I'm in training. I have these recipes that I learn from Mary and then I just roll them out as if they're my own. <laughs> I've stolen them. <laughs> not at all. That's great. Yeah. It's a great recipe. And beetroot. You're not a picker. My man. husband doesn't like beetroot, so the only That's way mine, I then. eat it is... Yeah, give it um, to me. I give it to you mostly. Yeah, then I eat it. Um, and I... I'd love to do more with beetroot, but I'd have to ask somebody round, and I'm not allowed to do that at the no, moment. No, no. But roasting beetroot with any other roots, with carrots and potatoes and parsnips, is always a nice base that will go with lovely. lots of other things. Absolutely lovely. Or warm roast, roasted, uh, cooked beetroot with feta and oh, herbs heaven, on top, heaven. and our own lettuce. So it's pick and come again. So do you think maybe we would be recommending that people grow a few simple vegetables on their doorstep so that they've always got fresh vegetables? For instance, we will just pick a lettuce leaf from each of the different lettuces yeah. and make a mixed salad yeah. rather than pulling up the whole lettuce and taking it home and throwing half of it away. Yeah. You, want, you want people to be successful in their attempts. So I think herbs are the number one. Yeah. Because it adds, I mean, chives and mint and parsley just add something to a something like a tabule. Um, it just it just brings it to another level. Fresh herbs. Any techniques for keeping things fresh at home in the freezer or in the fridge? In the fridge. Or it's just timing, really, it's, to eat it's them. Timing. I yeah. don't like to, I don't like to leave them long enough to have to think about. When, when I bring lettuces home, they go straight into cold water because lettuces from the allotment just flag. They're nothing like ones you buy from the supermarket. But by the time you've got them home, they're limp. Mm. So you have to throw them into cold water and they zhuzh up a bit. Yeah. But they certainly don't last. Yes, I even take the chard home and put it in a vase. So I have chard vases instead of flowers. Absolutely. So you chop off the end of the chard. There's put it in a vase of water there's and it lasts prettier. for days yeah. and it looks really pretty the rainbow chard and parsley yeah parsley the curly parsley lasts much longer and it's more frost resistant that's our curly parsley we've got italian parsley over there and that goes a bit soggy after a few days yeah and it's more um it's it's less frost hardy so i'm not relying on that all winter so a few summaries of your techniques um, I think no it's just... marmalade. <laughs> no, no, one, one marmalade a year. <laughs> one, one, one brew a year. Mm. No, I'm, I think that frugality just comes quite naturally. Um, and portion control to stop me eating too much. Mm. But I just hate to be beaten by something getting going off in the fridge. I mm. just don't like that at all. So it's planning and the freezer. Planning and the freezer. And if you've got a bunch of stuff in the free in the fridge, just put it all together and it'll probably come out lovely. Mm. Something you have or a frittata. A frittata you can put Always anything great. in a frittata. Put frittata. anything in a frittata. Yes. yes. That's wonderful. And Thank it freezes you so much. <laughs> yes and it freezes. Thank you Mary. It's a great pleasure. Totally. Yeah. The other thing with parsley, going back to parsley, cheese scones with parsley, oh. just fantastic and they freeze beautifully. Mm. So out they come with your lovely vegetable soup and it's... And your scones are ready. It's gourmet food. Yeah, yeah. So next up, 
Um, we have uh, Richard. Um, so I shall pass you over to him to uh, introduce himself and then we can share the presentation. All right, yep, thank you very much, Becca. Um, yeah, I'm Richard Andrews. Um, I've had an interest in composting probably going back about 30 years, doing home composting and um, you know, gardening, putting garden waste and food waste. Um, and then earlier this year, Sheila Bees and myself set up Grow Together, a community interest company. And part of our work is that we have a community allotment in High Wycombe. We have volunteers who help us. They help grow the produce and then they use the produce when it's complete. And as a byproduct of that, we generate a significant amount of organic material, um, which is to be composted. And so that's, that's something we, we, we want to, we then want to make use of that. Um, and so we've got a good opportunity on the allotment for, for creating compost. Um, I think compost is a bit like magic. Um, you know, you've got waste material, a bit like Andrew was saying, what garden, uh, food waste, etc. Yeah, just, just hold it on the first slide, uh, Becca. Um, uh, we, we got, um, it's a bit like magic. You've got uh, food waste and uh, by putting it in a compost bin, the end product will be something like this. So this is some compost from my bin in the garden. It's, it's uh, matured over a couple of years. But, you know, this is stuff that's really good for, for growing. Um, and as Andrew mentioned, um, home composting is a really good way of reducing waste. So if we think of our uh, cut chippings from the, the garden and food waste as an asset rather than a waste, then it's something we can really make use of. OK, um, and then next slide. Um, before we get too immersed in compost, so to speak, um, I, I think we've got a poll on this one, haven't we, um, Becca? So we'd just like to, to see if we can find out from people what their experience is of composting and um, what, what sort of, you know, how, how much, how familiar people are with it, whether it's something that they do or, or, or not. So if you'd all like to just click on those and then we can just sort of see what the, the level of experience is with composting. Some results coming in, Becca. All right, oh, great. So we've got to, um, yeah, looks as if there's uh, a, a good, a good um, selection of people who've got experience of composting, um, a few who would like to give it a try but don't really know where to start. Well, certainly for those, um, I can offer some tips, and hopefully for the others who are already composting things then um, you know, I, I can, can, we, we can learn a little bit more uh, about those. So, okay, if we can close, close up. Yeah, okay, so carrying on then. Um, so what I'd like to look at um, is about the, the composting process, um, the equipment that you would need for, for composting and what's best suited for different conditions, what to put into a compost bin, and what to leave out, because there's some food things that really don't compost very well. And how to do that in a safe way. So obviously, you know, you're not going to go badly wrong with composting, um, but just a few tips about uh, the safety side. And, and then finally, the benefits to the soil and the environment. Okay, so let's start then with the, with the, with the, with the basics of composting. Um, so, so um, so compost is a great way to add new nutrients and organic matter to your garden while reducing the amount of waste that goes to landfill. But as I said before, this material needn't really be waste, it's an asset. And sometimes compost is called black gold. So I think, you know, this is a, an ideal opportunity for us to create our own black gold. 
And in nature, compost occurs automatic, uh, not automatically, it just, it, it just occurs naturally. Um, it composts over time. And the benefit of putting compost or food waste into a compost bin is that by increasing the volume that we have, it accelerates the process because the temperature rises due to bacterial action. So first of all, um, in the next few compost, because the two are quite closely related, the importance of having a good balance of ingredients to get a reasonable carbon to nitri nitrogen ratio, the stages of composting, and the reasons for maintaining appropriate moisture levels. So next slide. So the looking at soil first, um, we probably think of soil as being made up of the mineral particles, so um, sand, silt, and clay. But actually, they only make up slightly less than half the volume of soil. Um, the other half being 25% um, of the total is air, 25% of the is water, and the remaining 5% is the, the really critical part for soil when it comes to growing plants is the hummus, uh, plant roots, and then the microbes, so worms, uh, slugs, uh, you know, and, and bacteria, which are a critical part of it, bacteria and fungi. I was quite surprised actually when I checked this out that how much is how much of soil is actually taken up by air and water. But there you go. Um, so compost is very similar to hummus, but it's not. So hummus is uh, compost will eventually decompose further into hummus. So compost is a really good thing to add to soil to improve the soil health. And for plants to grow well in the absence of chemical fertilizers. Hummus is the critical part of a soil competition. So hummus feeds the organisms required for healthy plant growth and making your own compost and adding it to your soil helps with that soil health. So it's an old adage, feed the soil and not the plants. I think this was something that Grant mentioned yesterday in the discussion after the David Attenborough films. And I, I've, I'm really, passionate about that. I think <clears throat> if you get the soil right, then you'll be able to grow the plants. Um, and we certainly need to do this uh, to prolong the life of our soils. Looking next at the compost life cycle, um, on the next slide, um, for those of you who are familiar with composting, which was most of you, you're, you're sort of probably, you already know this really, but I think it's useful just to run through it. Um, we start with organic matter that rots down in a bin or just in a pile, and that forms compost. The compost, when it's applied to the soil, supports plant growth. Uh, the organisms in the compost help improve the soil health, and that in turn supports the plants, you get more productive plants. You then make more compost from the waste material from those plants. So it's a, it's a circular process. You could say it's part, it's a, the original circular economy. <laughs> um, looking then at what to put into the compost, um, so this is getting a bit techy here, um, but I think it's helpful to have a little bit of science to either help you if you're wanting to start composting, or if you are composting already, um, to ensure that you do get a reasonable balance in your composts. So um, in composting terms, um, items are known as greens or browns. So greens being potentially a source of nitrogen, whereas browns are more a source of car carbon. And what we're looking for for the uh, compost, the finished compost, is a, a carbon to nitrogen ratio of around about 30 to one or 24 to one. Um, and um, to do that, generally, if you're adding compost bit by bit, a sort of a, an equal split of greens and browns materials will give you that. Um, if you have a bin and you fill it all in one go, you probably want to put in a bit more carbon to, to the nitrogen. Um, but I think one thing to look at here is um, that if we're, the main things most people will be composting will be vegetable waste and general garden waste. And if you look at those on the left-hand side, the vegetable waste is 25 to one, the garden waste is 30 to one. So those are around about the ratio we want in any case. 
So you're not going to go too far badly wrong use, using those and mixing those in. Um, and I know, remember, there was a question asked earlier about, is it okay to compost coffee grounds? Definitely, yes, it is. Um, they've got a good carbon-nitrogen ratio, and also um, they help to add a bit of structure to the compost. Um, so, so definitely add those. And I think I saw a question just pop up about tea bags. Um, certainly, I do compost the tea from tea bags. But I am rather pedantic about this, and I cut off the bags because the bags have plastic in them. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't like plastic in the soil. Okay, moving on to the next slide about the temperature profile. Um, so this is a temperature profile for an ideal compost bin, where you start off um, with temperature probably 10 degrees, um, you then go through three phases, each with different set of bacteria, gradually warming the compost, heating the compost, um, because each of the, the bacteria, the cyclophilic, the mesophilic, and the thermophilic, they all produce, they all um, heat as a byproduct of their metabolic activity, heat and water, and also some carbon dioxide. Um, so each, it's a bit like a relay race in a way. Each of the bacteria heat the bin a bit more to make the conditions right for the next uh, bacteria. And if you've got a large compost bin, you may find that you've got all three types of bacteria there at the same time because the centre of the heap will heat up, heat, heat up more quickly, whereas the outsides of the bin will be cooler. Um, but um, so, so as I say, yeah, bac bacteria, um, that they, they'll break down the carbon and the nitrogen, um, and in doing so, generating heat and water. But they also need oxygen to survive on. So they need aerobic conditions, um, which means that it's important to aerate the, the bin um, to encourage oxygen in to, to help them thrive. If you've built the, um, plant, the, the, the compost bin, in one go and put it in layers and you put some brown and then some greens and then some browns and then some greens and that helps to maintain the structure and so it's not as important to aerate that um, as it is if you add in material as and when um, as, and, as and when it becomes available. Um, on this chart you'll see there's some dips um, up in the thermophilic stage um, and so when the bin is aerated to, to increase the oxygen. Um, you'll see there's a bit of a dip in temperature after that, because obviously you're stirring things up, you, the temperature drops down, but then it will, it will build up again. Um, and the smaller the material is cut, the more, quick, the more quickly the temperature will rise, basically because you're making more surface area available, and it's the surface area of the plants that the bacteria can eat. So they can't eat into material. Um, but the downside is <laughs> the smaller you make material, the less structure it has. So then um, you need to aerate it more in order to, 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 to get the air supply in. Um, okay, I, I think I, I'm in danger of getting bogged down in the, <laughs> in the detail of the, the different stages. So probably best if I, if I move on now to the the next um, section about different types of compost bin, we can come back to that later if required. Um, so I think there are a few things to consider when choosing a compost bin. And I would suggest the first one is to make it accessible, make it as easy to feed your compost bin as it is to put, in put food waste into the council collection bin. So at home, we use a kitchen caddy, just have that on the work surface. Um, I then empty that into the compost bin every couple of days. Um, so that uh, makes it quite an easy operation. Um, also, um, when you're siting a bin, you want to make sure you've got enough space around it. Um, so that at some point, we all need to turn the compost in the bin. Um, and so that means digging it out, putting it somewhere, putting it back again. And so you need to have some space nearby. The size of the bin is important. And in theory, the bigger the bin, uh, the quicker it will de decompose. The material will decompose because it gets hotter, but that's only true if you fill the bin. So what I would say is it's more important to have a bin that's the right size for you 
than necessarily a large bin. I think the aesthetics of a bin are probably important as well. Um, and I mean, in the picture here, you can see certainly the one at the top is quite, a, you know, it's, a, it's sort of a nice smart bin. Um, and, you know, the, the, the one at the bottom as well is, is good. It fit, you know, blends in well with the plants around. So I think um, bear in mind where you put a compost bin if you're, if you're new to composting, just somewhere that's going to look reasonable in the garden. And in terms of the temperature, ideally site the bin in the shade um, or dappled shade so that it gets some, some sun and it, that, that certainly helps in the spring, help it warm up. Um, but we want a reasonably constant temperature. Um, so the microbial activity varies by season. Uh, the higher the ambient temperature, the quicker the compost reaches that thermophilic stage. But what we don't want is it getting very hot in the sun and then when the, when the sun moves on and goes into the shade, it cools right down again. So if we look at a few types of compost bin, um, we start with the large ones and move down to the smaller ones. So uh, if we move on to the next slide, um, the, uh, the first one I'm going to look at is um, the, it's a bin made of pallets. So this, this picture on the left is actually a quick compost bin that we, we put up down at the shared allotment. Um, and we've just started digging that material out. So um, this, these bins were built, I don't know, probably about July time. Um, and you can see, and we just dug them out, like the one on the right came out last week. So you can see it's not fully formed compost, um, but it's, it's fairly good material. Um, these are quite untidy, but they are quick and cheap to build. They're good for large volumes. Um, and if you want to, we want to leave them like this, you can actually plant green manure on the top of the compost bin while you're waiting for it all to, to decompose its more. Um, they like to be affected by the weather, so obviously the rain is going to get onto them and they may not heat up as not much as um, a, a better insulated bin. So on the right hand side, these are some large solid sided bins. So again, these are ones we've just built at the, the community allotment. Um, so they're better in that they heat up more quickly uh, because of the insulation. Um, these will have a lid on in order to, to enclose them. Um, so you get quicker composting. Um, it's a bit more complex, a bit more expensive to build than the pallet bills, pallet bins. Um, and you do require a lot of organic material if you have large bins like this. So um, good, good for places where you've got a, a lot of garden waste. Okay, the next slide. Um, the sort of bins that are probably more appropriate for most people in their gardens are um, either the, the insulated bin, the one on the left, or what I call the dialect type bin, um, the one on the right. Um, and um, both of these produce very good compost. Um, the, 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 the insulated bin, uh, that's very good for heating up quickly. Um, so that easily gets to the thermophilic stage. It is expensive though, um, and it does need a lot of maintenance. Um, I read somewhere they're a bit like a pet. You need to feed them the right uh, food. Um, you need to aerate the contents regularly because the contents needs to be cut up quite small to, to put in the bin. Um, and, um, and then they also need to be emptied fairly regularly. Um, but yeah, definitely good for, for getting to high temperatures. The one, the one on the right, the dialect bin, um, is uh, um, it's sort of a generic good composting bin. They're relatively inexpensive. And I think I saw earlier um, that there's a reduction available for council residents um, on, on, I think it's on the uh, Buckinghamshire Waste website. Um, they're, they're a good all-rounder. Um, I think often they're made, made from uh, recycled plastics, um, are available in a couple of sizes. And um, the only disadvantage I find with these is that the, the, the access hatch at the bottom um, it's not, you, you can dig and take material out, but then everything tends to collapse, but that's a fairly minor inconvenience. Um, and the, in the image on the right hand side uh, with the worms on the compost, that's the picture just taken inside 
um, a compost bin on the, on the right. So, you know, you get a lot of microbial activity in there as well. Okay, um, the next bin I'm looking at, we'll look at is the tumbler bin. Um, and these are, they, they're easy to use. So it's, it's a bit like a, a, a giant, um, a bit like a sort of 40 gallon oil drum, that sort of size. Uh, the lid um, can be, uh, it's just got a twist grip to, to fix it in place. So you just turn under the lid, put your compost in. And the benefit of them is that they're easy to tumble and to aerate. Um, and so it's good for those initial stages of composting. Uh, it's good that you don't get any pests getting into the bin because there's no contact with the ground. Um, the material can get a bit tangled around the horizontal axis, um, which is a bit of a disadvantage. And if they get too full, they're rather heavy to turn. So I, I would recommend, these are quite good for the early stages of composting, um, but then the compost really needs to mature in, in a conventional compost bin um, to, to finish it off. Um, moving on to a couple of smaller compost bins, finally, for the compost bin options. And I, I must say, these are things I don't have direct, direct experience of, um, but I, I understand they are good for um, composting in small spaces. So there's the Bakashi bins, um, which were Japanese origin. Um, and originally these were all used outside. So you'd have a hole in the ground, you'd have the bin on top, you put your food waste in, and effectively it's a fermentation process and the contents of the bin go straight into the soil. Um, the, the one in the picture here is one that can be used indoors. Um, so it's a lot easier to put your food scraps in. Um, and from what it says on the, on the literature, you can also compost meat, fish, and dairy produce, um, as well as organic material, because it's fermented as opposed to composted. Uh, the one on the left is a wormery, um, which is good for small spaces. They can either be used indoors or outdoors. Um, and the, the output from those is, is the liquid, um, which can be used as a feed, and also the uh, vermicompost, which is basically the worm casts. So in the little insert picture, um, there's a picture of some worms in one of my compost bins, and you can see there that the, the brown bits, which are the worm casts, which they leave behind. Uh, for some reason, the worms tend to congregate at the top of the, of the compost bins. I don't really know why. Okay, so that's the run, quick run through the compost bins in terms of tips for safely composting waste. Um, there's a few, a few sort of things to run through here. And I, I came across the term a few, a month or two ago about compost, calling it good enough compost. And I think this is a lovely phrase because, you know, most of us, we, we want compost that's going to be okay, it's going to be beneficial to the soil, it's going to help with this food, what, reducing food waste. Um, and, but but we, it's, it's not critical to us that it's absolutely um, made to perfection. So um, I think getting, getting the optimum balance of carbon to nitrogen is important, maintaining structure and adequately aerating the compost. And so all doing those things will avoid the compost going, aero going anaerobic. Um, and if that happens, it smells, it goes black, it goes gooey. Um, so you don't want that. But if that does start to happen, um, the best way to do it is to turn the compost heap. So basically empty the compost heap and put the contents back again, uh, ideally with some new drier material. So things like cardboard and newspaper are good for drying out that compost. Um, increasing the surface area of material um, increases the food source for the bacteria. So it's good to cut material up. I think I saw somebody ask about shredding material. <laughs> yes, definitely shredding material is a good thing to do before putting it into compost because that uh, helps it, that, that increases the surface area and um, reduce and, and therefore makes more food available to the bacteria. If possible, fill a bin in one go, but if that's not practical, do it bit by bit. And that really does work fine. Um, it just takes a little longer to decompose. 
Um, for the wormeries and the Bakeshi bins, they need regular feeding. Um, and generally speaking, for, for the conventional compost bins, they work best if they're full. Um, but it's more important to choose the right size for you. So choose a bin size that, that you'll be able to fill fairly easily rather than having a big one um, and then not filling it. Avoid composting cooked food or meat, although apparently for the Bakashi bins, that is okay. For conventional bins, um, ideally avoid getting vermin in the first place, but if you do find that you're troubled by rats or anything like that, um, putting mesh, um, sort of 12 mil space uh, mesh bars under the compost bin and stops, uh, stops them getting in. I would avoid putting uh, citrus fruit and things like that into the compost um, because that's something that I, I find doesn't compost well. So moving on then to what to put into the bin and what to leave out. Um, so yeah, I would, I would stick, well, I think the advice here really is the better you are at composting, the more you can get away with putting in the bin. Um, so things that are easy are the ones on the left-hand side. Um, certainly uh, I find particularly a mix of garden waste and food waste works particularly well for composting, um, including some cardboard or scrumpled up newspaper is good. That helps to maintain the moisture level in the bin. Um, in terms of things that are more difficult, yeah, certainly citrus fruit peel. Um, I find that just doesn't really compost very well. Eggshells are fine. Um, they won't compost, so break them up, wash them out, break them up, put them in the compost bin, um, but then and, and then they'll be a good source of calcium for the soil. Um, if persistent weeds, if the temperature gets up to 60 or 65 degrees centigrade, then that is adequate for killing the weeds. Um, but the, you, you've got to be fairly confident with your composting to get up to those temperatures. And the final thing that I've suggested was um, oily vegetation. So Christmas trees, laurel hedges, those sort of things, they take a longer time to decompose. Apparently one thing that worms like in compost is porridge oats. So uh, that's another one to, to uh, consider adding a small amount of that to your compost. Um, looking finally at the benefits to the soil and the environment. Um, so I think, yeah, I've said nature's way of upcycling. So I, I think really, as I said before, if you think of the waste or garden waste and food waste as an asset rather than a waste, then it's certainly something that we can, that you can make use of and you can create a soil improver. Um, so the bacteria levels in, and the fungi levels actually in compost are an order of magnitude greater than they are in a typical healthy soil. So by, by making compost and putting it into your soil, you are significantly boosting the bacteria and fungi levels. Um, that promotes good soil health. Um, also, you're sequestering carbon by um, getting, get, uh, put, creating compost, which is then becomes part of the, the soil. Um, Compost is use, useful as a top dressing because it suppresses weeds, uh, it improves port soil structure, and I come back to this thing, it's feeding the soil, not the plants. And then finally, looking at the environmental benefits, um, yeah, it reduces the amount of waste to be processed by the council. Um, it encourages wildlife, so particularly worms, they, they are very prevalent in compost. Uh, by using compost, you reduce the need for chemical fertilizers and it helps, helps restore the interaction between plants and healthy soils. Whereas chemical fertilizers, from what I understand, bypass that, they go directly to the plant, um, making the plants more dependent on fertilizers. So that's me and that's uh, so any questions?
quite a few questions. <laughs> so it's better if I come in with the questions now. Great. Um, so we had um, a couple of questions about pests. So you mentioned a, a wire mesh at the bottom of the bin to uh, deter rats, but we did have a question about uh, from someone who said they only compost garden waste because of problems with rats getting into the bin and any tips to deter them. And then another question about a lot of small fruit flies in a compost bin, in a Dalek style compost bin from Kyla and any reason from that. She says she's added more browns, but still lots of small fruit flies. Um, okay. Yeah, so those two about pests and then we'll come back. Yeah, to um, I, th I think um, in, dealing with the first one first about the vermin and the rats. Um, Yes, I, I, I had an experience one year where I had a surplus of potatoes um, and I, I composted quite a lot of um, whole potatoes and I then discovered that rats love potatoes and raw potatoes. Um, so I, I'm cautious on that now. I, I make sure that I don't post a lot of those. I think also onions, if you have a lot of onions, those are supposed to, to be similar. Um, so I think the, the important thing is to try and make sure that you, you minimize the amount of anything that would attract pests um, and mix, cut, cut them up and mix them in well with, with other material and compost. Um, but certainly, um, yeah, putting a mesh at the bottom of the bin, um, I have found has been effective in, in stopping vermin getting in. Um, relation to the fruit flies, yes, they can be a problem sometimes on bins. Um, I found um, that turning a bin is often a good way of, um, of dissipating the fruit flies. So what, what you tend to find is that you get them when you've got a lot of decomposing fruit uh, or, or that similar things. Um, and when you turn the bin, you can mix that in better with other material. Um, so that, that would be my advice would be to turn the bin. And on that note, we had a, a question about any practical tips on getting air into Dalek compost bins. So how how to turn the contents, the easiest way to turn the contents. Yeah. And also a question about what you think of the dig and bury technique, <laughs> which sounds sounds suspicious to me. But <laughs> the what technique? The dig and bury technique. Dig and bury, yes. Um, yeah, okay. Um, okay, the, the, on, the, on the turning the contents of a dialect type bin, um, I normally just use a border fork, so a, a small fork, um, and basically just shove that into the bin and, and twist it around a bit, uh, maybe, lift, maybe lift the contents slightly. So it, as long as you aerate the bin as you go, um, you, you shouldn't need to go down you know, particularly deep with aerating the bin. Um, so the aeration is needed to ensure the bacteria get the oxygen they need. And once you've got past the thermophilic stage, once the compost starts cooling down, then it, you have a long maturation stage. Um, and at that point, once it started maturing, then you should be turning the content of the bin just to, to make sure it's more evenly distributed. Um, so yeah, I, I would use a border fork, um, something like that, for turning the contents of the, uh, sorry, for aerating the, the dialect bin. And then the dig and bury. Um, yeah, I have to say, um, I've never actually tried this myself. Um, so I, I know that th there are approaches um, of basically just burying um, organic material. Um, and it's, uh, there's, there's another technique, I can't remember the name of it, but one can make long mounds where basically you, you put the organic material in and cover it with soil. So I don't, I don't know if anybody else on the call possibly has, has experience of doing that. I did try it um, <laughs> before I got my compost bin from uh, Bucks Council. Uh, in the first lockdown, I did actually try it after seeing a uh, a YouTube video um, where a guy had sort of more sort of vegetable beds and raised beds, and I did sort of bury some um, vegetable waste and things like that in the garden. Um, but I know he he buried like a chicken carcass and and things like that. 
So uh, yeah, I have I have tried it with sort of birds and mice in the garden that my cat brings brings back, um, as well as as garden waste as well. But it, it's supposed to be quite good for for your plants. But <laughs> that's as far as I got. <laughs> Uh, I think one point in relation to burying material that's not fully decomposed is that the decomposition process then occurs and that robs nitrogen from the soil. Um, so it's, I think if you're, do, if you're burying material, um, don't expect to be able to grow plants productively on that site for a year or so after you've done the burying. I was, I was just going to jump in and suggest that there's a thing called a green cone, which is kind of designed for that premise that you kind of half bury it in the ground. So it's kind of like a composter. It's got a double skin and you add bacteria to it. So you bury it in a, in a spot in your garden that you're comfortable with. You can put all cooked and uncooked food and, and everything from the kitchen in there with a mixture of bacteria that they send you. And it kind of, again, it almost like a human stomach. It kind of produces a lot of heat and it eventually just goes into the soil and feeds the soil around. It's very different to a compost that you can't chuck loads of garden waste in there. It's just for kind of kitchen waste. And it's a bit more expensive than a normal composter. But if that was something you were thinking of, have a look at it. Just Google green cone and, and have a look at that and see what you think. Thanks, guys. Um, Andrew, maybe while you're here, while you were talking about anaerobic digestion, Sheila was asking if the digestate, the leftover digestate from anaerobic digestion is available for householders or allotment holders to use on their on their plots. You, you, you wouldn't want it. It's um, what's the nicest way to say it? it's industrial grade. It's very, <laughs> very strong. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's just not suitable to kind of go and tap off a, a bottle and give it to allotment holders. So farmers use it and they water it down significantly and, and get the right doses. So yeah, it's, it's an industrial product. It's very really good for the soil, but it's, yeah, it's not kind of a, 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 an amateur's uh, product really. Okay. Okay. And then I think a last question on home composting, whether there's a type of bin, Richard, that you recommend for a small garden or a balcony? Yeah. Um, I think for this small garden, I would probably recommend a, a hot bin um, in that those are quite compact. Again, I think you can get them in two different sizes um, and they're, they're quite, they, they produce compost quite quickly. Um, for a balcony, probably a wormery, I think would be the best. Um, I'm guessing if somebody's got a balcony, they don't have a garden. Um, so probably then in that case, it would just be food waste that they'll be looking to get rid of. So the wormeries, I think, are tend, tend to be, yeah, the, the wormeries, um, the, the food that worms require is, is uh, food waste. So yeah, I'd say a wormery for a balcony, wormery for a balcony, and probably a, a hot bin or a small dialect bin for a, for a small garden. Great. I think that's all the questions. Unless anyone, um, Emily has also asked um, Andrew if you can provide a link to where people can obtain a composter or discounted composter through Bucks County Council. Yeah, um, I've just I've just picked that in. So we we reduce the cost of the Dalek style two versions of. So we don't do the whole remit of possible compost bins. We do the kind of basic <laughs> compost bins that are offer slightly cheap cost. So if you just go to getcomposting.com and put your post code in it all works. Yeah, I've just put that on. I think it didn't get sent to everyone, so I've just put your link back back on there, Andrew. So yeah, so thank you everyone for that. And uh, I always get quite inspired by composting. So <laughs> thank you very much uh, to all our presenters. Um, and as I say, I, I will be putting um, some some of the, the presentations and, and that sort of thing. Uh, out to everyone in the next couple of weeks as, as well as hopefully putting the videos recording of, of this session.